Okay, call this meeting to order. Today's Tuesday, February the 8th, 2022, the Curriculum Committee meeting. Um, item 2.1, review and discussion of the Memorandum of Understanding between San Diego CISD and Workforce Solutions, Cameron County. Dr. Carmen? So I think Ms. Alvarado has that information, oh. correct? Oh. Yes, correct. Good evening, board. Good evening, board president, superintendent Carmen. This is our um, MOU with uh, Workforce Solution Cameron um, with our high school students. Um, these are for the internships for um, STEM related uh, classes, like uh, Ms. Maney stated in her comment. Um, I um, have, Mr. Weller has reviewed the MOU. We are adding a few things and I've already contacted um, Mrs. Ramirez who's in charge um, to make those changes on the MOU. Just some, some verbiage that needs to be on there. But other than that, this is a I'm uh, hoping to put this on the agenda. Questions? Questions? Okay, item agenda. Okay, item 2.2, review and discussion of district by design agreement between San Benito CISD and Capturing Kids Hearts by Flippin Group for the 2022-2023 school year. I'll have Ms. Ramirez and Mr. Hartman approach uh, the microphone, please. Podium. Good afternoon, Dr. Carmen, board president, members of the board. Hey, how you doing? Good, good, good. I'd like to introduce Mr. Mark Hartman, who works with uh, the flip, flipping group. So we, we are here requesting um, you know, approval to become an agenda item for uh, the Capturing Kids Hearts proposal for next school year. i uh, just like to kind of a little reminder <clears throat> of what Capturing Kids Hearts is, and this is a social emotional uh, process focused the Foundation for Sustainable Transformation in our district and with our students. It's a process to provide the strategy and training for teachers and administrators to achieve success in today's classroom. Educators in pre-K-12 are equipped to implement transformational processes focused on social emotional well-being, relationship-driven campus culture, and student connectedness. So um, this is something that we are looking to implement with this coming school year. We will have all of our um, campuses trained, uh, which is something we will have common language across the district. Um, so we're looking to strengthen our student connectedness and also have consistent rules um, of conduct. Um, one thing I'd like to share are just some survey results from staff when we trained our staff last year compared uh, to this year. So last year, 58% of, of the staff that was trained responded to the survey. Of that 90.5% 90, 90 um, agreed or strongly disagreed, the strategies will be implemented in their classrooms and in their schools. And 90.4%, the content is important to improve outcomes. And the schools that were trained that year included Angela Leal, Rangerville, and all of our three middle schools. The following year, 68% um, of the staff responded to the survey, and there was a 3.3% 3, 3 point uh, increase as far as strategies being implemented in the classroom, which was at 93.2%, and there was a four point increase to 94% for content um, important to improve outcomes. The schools that were trained this year were Fred Booth, Oscar de la Fuente, Sullivan, VMA, and 50 staff, 50 staff members from the high school. Ms. Ramirez, before you go on, can you go back to that previous slide, please? Under that first strategy, uh, that, that question for the survey strategies will be implemented in my classroom. 93.2% of educators, 136 roughly reported they agree or strongly agree mm -hmm. that the strategies will be implemented in their classrooms. Do we have data that says it was implemented? This is a survey. Do we have mm -hmm. data that says it was implemented with fidelity to correlate to this 93.2%? Uh, the, the, to, to measure that exactly, it's kind of difficult. And remember that this is a process so when we look at additional surveys, because there's another survey that I'm going to share in a little bit, we surveyed okay. all the staff, leaders, uh, teachers, and staff as well. And it's, it was a survey based on implementation. So they're saying that they, that they are doing these things. And that's asking specific things, because there are different pieces that go with this process, which could include good things. Are you starting your day with good things? 
right? You know, bringing everybody right. together, morning meeting, you know, talking about great things. Are you launching at the end of the period? And meaning, how are you closing your, your day or your period? Are you ending the day on a positive note? So teachers were asked these questions, leaders were asked these questions. Um, so this is what, what they're reporting that they have, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, and can we, uh, by, by next Tuesday before we meet, if, mm -hmm. if this does become an agenda item, can we have a copy of the actual survey? Most with the definitely. questions being asked, please? Yes, actually, well, I have one, but I'm sorry about being provided, but no, I do have fine. one. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ma'am. There's a, if I remember correctly, when this was presented and I, when we visited one of the campuses that implements this program, there's like something that, the posted in the classroom. The social contract. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's reflective of this. That is part of it, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we also have Mr. Galvan here in the audience, and I've asked him if, he, if you all have any questions for him as a campus principal to kind of share some of the things that his staff has been doing. And he's ready to share, so please ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs> So, so just briefly, we started this process in 2019-20, starting with Frank Roberts Elementary. Then it shows the schools here that were trained in 2020, 2021, and then the schools that were trained in 2021, 2022. Along with this, just a reminder that our sixth graders are going through the Lead Worthy uh, course. So our sixth and seventh graders this year have both gone through this course. By next year, we continue this process. Um, then all of our middle school students, sixth through eighth, will have gone through the Lead Worthy course. And of course, the hope is that we continue with our high schools as well. One, one thing I wanted to interject that we're doing a lot right now due to COVID is we're hoping to help the teacher situation in all school districts. Obviously, we have a shortage of substitute teachers and we have a shortage of teachers and we don't know at the end of this year what's gonna happen um, with teachers and administrators, but um, the Flippin Group, we also have something called Teach Worthy. Mm -hmm. And what Teach Worthy is, is we help students that have already graduated from college to get their teaching credentials in a fashion that's consistent with capturing kids' way, capturing kids' hearts, and at the same time, giving them their teaching credentials and the hours that they need through a university that we're working with. But what, where we've steered a little bit in an accelerated fashion is we're wanting to work also with the juniors and seniors so that we can talk and communicate to them through what we're doing in the, in the class and also with um, Lead Worthy is, is this something that you want to do? Do you want to be an educator when you get out of school? And if so, we're providing a way where they can come out as a senior and their next year they can go into a classroom if it's approved by the board and approved by um, the, the school saying, you know what, we'll take them as an unaccredited teacher right now. We'll have a master teacher oversee six or seven or eight of them. Their schooling is paid for through the same price that if you put a teacher into a classroom, it's reducing um, the cost of what this, a paraprofessional right now may get $12,000 going to a classroom, let's say, and a teacher gets, what does a starting teacher get? They're like 54? 50. Mm -hmm. So let's say 50. So you have one of these students now that is a senior graduated going into the classroom in the primary schools and they're now becoming, through our accreditation, a teacher that can be in there overseen by a master teacher and it's all their education is paid for through this. Um, the time that the master teacher is overseeing seven or eight students is paid through this and that's the same as paying a teacher in a classroom. So what we're doing is we're trying to help you fill the classrooms with teachers that are excited about it and students that are excited about education. And it's something brand new and we're trying to be at the forefront of trying to help school districts get more teachers back in. So this is something you've already implemented? We are, and we're, we, have, we have some beta tests going on in the Dallas area right now. One school district, um, 50 students are going forward with this and we're excited to see the, the results as those come about. And now we have school districts starting in September that want to do it. So right now the only place that's been implemented is in Dallas? That's correct. Okay. That's the first, we just brought it out this, this year to see how it would go and how it was received. Um, but now we're seeing districts and it was uh, introduced at TASA with this school district this last week when we were there and the overwhelming response from superintendents saying we need more avenues to try to get more teachers in the classroom and get them excited about it. And at the same time, drop the cost of education for parents and these students so they don't have to worry about that by getting accredited through this program. Great. 
-hmm. Any more questions? This program, uh, from what I'm seeing here, uh, or this process as you all call it, it would cost the district $387,000. What I'm seeing here is uh, two days of training, the, and the, those three are the days initial of training. So for five days of training, we're going to get pay uh, three hundred eighty-seven thousand. So that the first the first two days of training is the initial training, and for we need to start off with the training for nine campuses. Right, for for, nine it'll groups, be for for just... eight. Yeah, for eight campuses, which are these campuses here. These are the last campuses that need to be trained, including our alternative campuses right. that I forgot to list. Um, so with that, all of the entire district will be trained. So the, the first two days is for the initial, for these campuses that have not been trained. But when, then, we're, when we're saying two days, it's actually many trainings done at the same time. It's not just one training being done for just 50 people. There's 450 people being trained at this for all these different, the same thing as being trained those two days with nine different locations being done. Mm -hmm. So 450 of our staff will be trained mm -hmm. on this? Okay, and so it includes those schools right there. Um, and so what happens to the other schools that were part of it last year? So if I can go on, well, let me just say these are the schools. And then the other thing that we're wanting to add this year is a leadership blueprint. So the leadership blueprint would include all of our uh, campus administrators, our principals, assistant principals, deans, um, including all of the directors. Uh, this would be our operational uh, district leaders as well as our academic leaders. And I even have you all on your all's names on here too, so you can be part of the training too. And, um, and what that is, it's a 360 profile of your strengths and constraints. And it allows you as a team to work better together to see my strengths, how I can be better at my constraints and, and, and work those out with the team that I'm on. But as an administration working together also with each school and then the, the principals being able to work that well with the teachers and working on strengths and constraints of each other. And right now with everything that seems to be going on, the more relational we are with one another and building those relationships with the principals and admin to make sure they are caring for each other and then the principals and their teachers is paramount. I think that the social emotional learning part for every campus is very, very important. That's a foundation um, for the staff and for the kids as well. Um, however, if we're going to invest in something, you're saying here that you're decreasing disciplinary referrals, increasing attendance, increasing test scores, increasing teacher attendance, and decreasing teacher turnover. How are you all going to prove that that is happening because of your program and not just because uh, you know, um, and Ms. Lopez, I am going to share something on discipline referrals in just a minute, and then we'll talk uh -huh. about everything else. Yeah, because I'm about data, and mm -hmm. when I implemented the counseling program here, we reduced disciplinary referrals by 60 percent, but we had data to back it up. It we wasn't do. just we think it works; it does mm -hmm. work. We proved it. Right. It's important. So again, these are the schools, and then this proposal that we would like to get uh, on agenda and approved is also including the leadership blueprint. Uh, this next slide talks about the components in the, con in the uh, proposal, which is a leadership blueprint, the initial capturing kids' hearts training for the eight campuses, the process champions training, which includes, it'll include selected people from each of the campuses that will come in and be the process champions. So they're like the cheerleaders making sure that, that the processes are still carried on. You know, they're the ones that also lead staff meetings. Uh, so they're welcoming, they're the welcoming committee and kind of, kind of also using the pieces of the process, the good things, uh, the communication, the launching of the, st during the staff meetings. And I have a sample of an agenda that Fred Booth Elementary actually, where they use the Excel model in their agenda. So they are using the process throughout. It's not just in the classroom. Uh, but we'll get that to that in just a minute. Uh, this also includes a recharge training for all the campuses that had been previously trained. So we train them and we want to make sure that they're still familiar with the process and still continuing to be supported. It also includes campus traction visits. So this is where personnel from the flipping group will come into the campuses and we had that happen this year. Also, Mr. Galvan can talk about that too because he was one of the campuses that was visited. Uh, so these, these consultants come in and they're observing what's going on during the day. Are teachers greeting kids at the door? Are their social contracts posted? Are they starting the day with good things? Are they launching at the end of the day? And then they have debriefs with, with the process champions too because the principals will 
uh, make the time for the process champions to also meet with these consultants to kind of see what support they need and also help them continue the process. And they give the, the administrators feedback. And, and to your point, Ms. Lopez, in reference to data on that, you know, one of the best things to see is kids that want to be in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, if they want to be in the classroom and the teachers enjoy building that relationship with them in the classroom, those get some of the outcomes that you'll see here in a minute um, that show the data that you're asking for because it's important. If the kids don't want to be there um, and they're not building relationships with one another and with the classroom teacher, there's a problem and statistics will go down, as you said. Mm -hmm. And then this also includes a CKH premium, uh, which provides a lot of resources for the campuses. Um, and one example is the, like the monthly newsletter. You all got a copy of that. It's in English and Spanish. It's a primary edition, secondary edition. So every month there is a theme that is, that is designated for each month. Um, and the newsletter goes home to help that way families can also support the theme for the month as well. That the, each theme is set up with character ed. So it's required by the state to have character ed for from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. So we align ourselves with what we're doing with capturing kids' hearts mm -hmm. and the character ed that's happening within the classroom so that now throughout that whole month, every day, the teachers are getting updates from us on character ed through their emails and uh, mm -hmm. on their Monday morning leadership uh, the principals are getting their letters on it also on how to have that character ed lesson be effective with the teachers while the teachers are getting in how to be effective with the students. And then the, what you have in front of you is our monthly newsletter that we send home in Spanish and in English to the parents so they know what's going on. And you know what? If we have a culture change because things start to happen at home because they're seeing these same things and these outcomes at home, then that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Right, and they, in that resource also they have, uh, the teachers have lesson plans for good things for launching in case they don't, they don't know exactly what to do. It'll walk them through the process as well. It also has lesson plans for the process champions. So during staff meetings, many, sometimes the administrators will give the process champions time to kind of introduce or to refresh, you know, or to introduce a process or a piece uh, just to make sure that they're practicing it also and modeling for their teachers. And this also includes a monthly cohort call that all the principals are on a call with other principals that are part of the CKH family. Um, so they share ideas too that they're doing, that they're implementing on their campuses as well. Now the next slide, this is, uh, these are some numbers that uh, Mr. Martinez helped me pull for our discipline referrals. So one thing, I, I, I picked five of the things that I saw on each of the three years um, so, and again, the three years are 2019, I mean, you know, these three years that are listed. But one thing I would like to keep and keep, for y'all to keep in mind, is that in 2019, 2020, that was our first year with COVID, after March 13, you know, we didn't come back. March 20, I'm um, sorry, 2020, 2021, this is when I think we came back in October, and we gradually started bringing students in. At that time, too, the, we had the, the six feet social distancing requirement. There was a lot of protocols in place to try to keep people safe. This year, it's been a little more normal year, right, where, where restrictions have kind of been a little bit um, lessened, you know, but still, there's still, you know, people are still scared to be together and so forth. So really, I would, if I had to compare these, it's kind of hard because we're not really comparing apples to apples, but if I had to pick any two of these years to, to compare fairly, it would be 2019-20 to 21-22 because they're a little bit more similar. Still not the same though. So when we compare those, for conduct punishable as a felony, there was two, and this year so far there has been two. Controlled substance, there was 54. Right now there's 34. Alcohol possessions, there was one. In this year, there's been three. Code of, uh, code of conduct violations, in 1920, there was 2,253, whereas right now, there's 938. Um, felony controlled substance, there was 20. To this year, right now, as of right now, there's six. And fighting, there was 25, and now there's 21. So there has been a decrease when we try to compare this, the years that are most similar. Can I ask you a question? Are, are these based on what schools? Uh, the district. Okay, so that's a key point that I want to share with you, that we're seeing from 2019 to 2000, uh, uh, 2020, 
and 2021-2022, but the high school hasn't even had time yet to have the trainings, okay? So what I'm trying to share with you is we see a lot of acting out in our high schools. We see probably more alcohol possession. I'm not saying for sure, but the, my guess is probably more in the high school than we would see in an elementary school or a middle school, potentially. So these numbers still are showing a great reduction and we're not even, we're not even continuing with the, with the mm -hmm. high school yet. So mm -hmm. those will come down even further. Mm -hmm. So any questions on the referrals? Okay, and as far, as far as attendance, I mean, I don't have a report on attendance, but I mean, we all know that, you know, there's been a change in enrollment. There's been a change in, I mean, attendance has fluctuated. It kind of goes with the COVID spike too. If we see more cases, people are, you know, being kept home. So it's really unfair to kind of give accurate numbers even when it comes to attendance. Ms. Ramirez, what's Monday. concerning to me, and maybe we need to go back, and I'm not saying it's, it's wrong, but it, mm -hmm. it, it's, it, does, it sounds crazy to me if we haven't included the high school here, and we're looking at 2019, 2020, when we're looking at the elementary campuses, we're, co we're quoting there, there's 25 fights. That's, no, th that's, this is not just elementary. This is, this is elementary this and is, middle school. This is every one. And, and high I will, school. Yes. And I, and, and I will say most of the referrals that are, that are documented are more the secondary schools. Okay. And that, that's mm -hmm. what I was trying and to And if you need out. a breakdown, I, I, we can break that down for you as well. Once we implement in the high schools, then we're having systemic change and it's being done with fidelity. With I, would I would provide a breakdown for us. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll get that for you all. So just to be clear, this is all of the referrals throughout the entire that district. That have been documented on Skyward. And the entire district. And we only have... 75% of the schools that have this program? Uh, I would say well, we have eight, we still need eight. So, I mean, we count the alternative campuses, but those are really, really small, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So, so about 75% mm -hmm. of our schools have started this, have mm -hmm. done this since 2019 to 2020. And then this is the entire district. Mm -hmm. right. so, so we don't can, even know which schools. Right. And mm -hmm. we'll get that, like what you just said. Okay. But you can see, a, I mean, there is a decent reduction of, of these things happening, and this is including the, the schools that we haven't even worked with yet. Yeah, so. and I, I'd like to just point out that the fact that it is COVID years and all this data is very, is skewed because mm -hmm. of that, mm -hmm. attendance, right. referrals, things like that. But just the code of conduct alone has seen a dramatic decrease, mm -hmm. and I feel like those are the ones that kind of, that this program more or less targets, mm -hmm. code of conduct violations, like mm -hmm. being kind to one another, mm -hmm and things like that. I still say that the fighting that doesn't seem realistic, not for the district, 25 fights for the entire district for a school year, it doesn't seem and right. Again, so I think the, we need the, to... This is what's reported in Skyward. So I only know, I can only pull the numbers from, from the numbers we have access to. So and we can't really say that it, it is capturing hearts that's making the changes because if we didn't implement it in the high school and you're saying, well, there was changes at the high school, well, we didn't imp implement it at the high school, you know? So mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the program at the high school that's making changes, you know? And so, yeah, that, like uh, Mr. Medrano said, uh, it would be good to break it up into the mm -hmm. schools that did participate and see mm -hmm. how it did affect them, st you know, with the data statistically, because if y'all are telling us, you know, well, use our program, we're gonna de decrease these things, but you're not even showing us that you are decreasing. Well, we, we, do, we, did, have, then, we did have all the administrators you know, and 50, 50 teachers from the high school trained. We've had VMA trained and we've had middle school trained. And I will say, I would probably venture to say that most of these that are documented are probably from the secondary campus. So not all the high school has been trained, but we do have, you know, a decent number, 50 people at least trained at the high school, along with our middle schools and VMA, which makes up the majority of our secondary. Mm -hmm. I, I, got, mm -hmm. I got a comment to make, Mr. Ramirez. I, 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 uh, I'm going to go uh, revert back to what uh, what, uh, what Dr. Cruz said as far as, you know, uh, the stress level on the kids right now across the board for the past couple of years. I mean, you know, who who are we kidding? You know, at the, at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the day, I think what needs to what needs to come up and the thing that we need to really focus on is what the teachers feel mm -hmm. and the administration and stuff like that as far as this type of process that's being rolled out to support them and support the kids and the, the backing that that, that's being provided. I think that's the number one thing. As far as numbers and stuff like that, I mean, all this is sketchy. Some kids aren't even coming to school. So, you know, I think, I think at the end of the day, I think what we really need to focus on is go back and support our staff, you know, mm -hmm. and give them that initial support and the kids that support that are, that are coming mm -hmm. to school 
and that have been affected, you know, dramatically by this, by this, uh, you know, uh, the situation that we got going on right now. So, I mean, we can talk about this all day long about numbers and stuff like that, but I'm not, it's not about data. To me, it's, it's about right now, this whole situation, this data skewed is very mm -hmm. obvious, you know, but we need to talk about the, you know, how it's impacted our staff. We need to talk about, you know, how we're going to get them back to, mm -hmm. to give them the support, the emotional support to allow them to give our kids the tools to succeed. But we, we as a board, what programs are we going to give them to support our staff and, and, and keep them here and keep them happy and safe? Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you know, I respect everybody's opinion, but that's mine. So mm -hmm. I, I, I appreciate Ariel's, uh, you know, opinion on that. And, and I mean, it, it is what it is. It's, mm -hmm. it's, that's just the, the cold hard and, truth. And, and even when it comes to teacher satisfaction, that's really hard to measure this year too because COVID is really going to impact how satisfied they are. We have people that are ready to retire, jump mm -hmm. ship, you know, and it's, it's really the impact of COVID that has had on everyone. Yeah, it's just really surprising to me that we're questioning this program that's giving us these social emotional learning tools to use in this time that we really need these social emotional tools. And if this helps our, like I said, data is important, mm -hmm. data is skewed right now, but the feeling when you walk on that campus, that's the most important thing to me. Yeah, and I, I, I'd and like Mr. Gonzalez, you know, to be to share what's happening on his campus and how he feels it's impacted his campus. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> Is that all? Okay, guys. My heart was captured 30 years ago. I've been through the program in Westlaco, Raymondville, and now in San Benito. It has helped my campus. The teachers, you should see them. We have affirmation walls where they share and they complement each other. My campus is all with it. We have all those meetings she mentioned with, us, with the other schools and all that. And they're working. My champion group is working because we want to be one of the top schools that's really helping the kids and them and the district, and we're going to get it. It is very successful. I know it's hard with a pandemic, with all this stuff, the social, emotional, and all that. But today, I was walking around the whole school, and they were, the teachers do their instruction, and then they do affirmations, not only in the classroom. They do it in the whole area, like the English department, the science department, the math department. And I even have a so, uh, affirmation um, board in my off in the office area and teachers do affirmations to each other and to me and it's nice when they say thank you Mr. Calvin we're doing good but we need that to create uh, right now because of the social emotional stress that we're going through I highly recommend it I like it my staff likes it and we're working because there's a uh, an, an, an honor that you get when you really get involved in your school and my teachers want it, and we're going to work at it and represent you throughout the country. So, thank you, Mr. Galvan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Galvan. That's great to hear because a lot of times after the school district recommends certain programs, then we get phone calls that people are not satisfied with specific programs and so forth. You know, and so again, I'm the biggest proponent for social emotional learning yes. as a mental health provider. You know, so I know the benefit of it. Um, but the question on the data was, y'all are telling us you're decreasing these, then show us, you know, that you're decreasing also, you know, uh, and I'm talking about to the, the you know, the Capturing Hearts uh, organization, um, which is an added bonus for us that you're showing us facts as, as well, you know. Okay. So uh, I don't want anyone to misconstrue what I was saying. I am no, 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 for no. the program. I just... Uh, was asking about where is the data that you that you all are saying here that you're reducing things. So where's, show us the data. And if the teachers buy in, it works, and they're buying in, and they help me that we meet Thank with the other schools, and every month we have. Strategies. Yeah, the strategies, and I call her. And I say, hey, I need for you to meet with this certain group, and she does. Thank you, guys. I appreciate Thank your you. information, appreciate Mr. Thank Galvan. You. I'd like to make a recommendation. Do we make it an agenda item? Yeah, agenda item. Okay. Any other questions? No questions, mm -hmm. but item 2.3, okay. uh, review and discussion of the transformation framework agreement between San Benito CISD and Mark White Learning LLC for the 2022-2023 school year. At this time, uh, we'll be tabling this um, Table. item due to procurement timelines that we have not met just yet. Okay. So we'll be tabling this. Okay, no problem. Item's been tabled. 
Item 2.4, review and discussion of the letter agreement between San Benito CISD and the Texas A&M Engineering Experiment Station, TEES. I'll have Mr. Ramirez and Mrs. Gomez approach the podium to discuss the MOU. He's such a gentleman. Before we move on to, to this, um, I think it is relevant to um, add to um, capturing kids' hearts that we go through an effective schools framework um, through the Texas Instructional Leadership Grant. And just recently, we um, did some walkthroughs and observations. And when the campus um, participates in the Effective Schools Framework through the, the uh, TIL program, the TIL grant, um, there are five levers. And the first one has to do with um, things like, um, um, I beg your pardon, three has to do, lever three has to do with campus culture. So when we can speak to these things when we're walking around with Region 1 who's training us and we can point to um, these affirmations and things like that, that gives us credit for building that positive campus culture. So while it's so important to have that quantitative data, there is that qualitative data as well. And that comes from those interviews with the teachers and so forth. Um, I know I took up more time than I, than I should, but I just wanted to add that as well because that's a component that um, I hadn't really discussed with Ms. Ramirez, um, but I, I um, it just happened recently and it occurred to me, you know, that, that gained us a lot of recognition on the report that we got back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, to speak to, well, good evening, board, and Dr. Carmen. To speak to what's before us here with the uh, MOU with the High School Aerospace Scholars Program, uh, we were approached by Texas A&M uh, Engineering Experiment and Station uh, Group. So essentially, they're advisors that work with the SPARC program through Texas A&M University. Um, and what they approached us with was a wonderful opportunity for kids. Uh, we have one student currently that's participating in this program at San Diego High School uh, without the help of an, of an advisor or anything like that. Uh, and what this does for us is it provides us $19,000 of grant money, um, of which $10,000 is um, earmarked for 10 students that are participating and completing the program. That effectively becomes $1,000 of scholarship money for them just for completing the modules. Um, it also provides us with $2,000 worth of money for stipends to uh, give to two mentor teachers that will walk these students through their modules if they have any questions. Essentially, they want somebody that's involved in the STEM area, science, technology, engineering, or mathematics. Um, and then the last portion of that money is to allocate for student trips. One, uh, to Texas A&M University, so they can go and see the university, uh, especially the engineering mathematics department. And then secondly, uh, for engagements, it could be for a local engagement uh, with speakers. It could be a local engagement to a university nearby. They have a remote um, uh, location in McAllen that they also recommended that we, that we visit. Um, but that's essentially what this grant's all about. It's a big chunk of free money with a lot of guidance and support and essentially also gives our, our, our students that are interested in the field of aeronautics and space an opportunity to experience it firsthand uh, at the Johnson Space Center. So that's what we hope to get out of this. And uh, we're very uh, grateful to have this in front of us and we hope that the board Thank you. Um, Thank you, Mr. Ramirez, for what you do and, and uh, your excellence and your expertise on this. And, I, and, and no credit to things? me, I will also say that one of the individuals, the advisors, is a former San Benito High School graduate and graduated with me in 2006. And so he was like, yeah. I'm not letting you guys stay behind. Los Fresnos has this going on and y'all yeah. got to get your fair share. So that's that was really what, what brought it to us and or why we're so excited. Any questions? Agenda item. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Committee concerns? Yes, Mr. Medrano. Um, one of the things that has come to my attention, uh, and we've discussed this before, uh, when it comes to the student dress code, I've been getting a lot of concerns from staff members at the up, at the uh, secondary level, saying that the the kids' dress attire is very inappropriate. Uh, the girls are wearing too clothes with too much cleavage, or you know, clothes is too short, and so forth, and. So the, employ the employees are concerned. I wanted to bring it up to, uh, to Dr. Carmen so y'all can look into that because I'm getting too many, too, many, too many concerns from employees saying that they're concerned about that and that they don't want to be uh, you know, accused by kids that they're looking at them or anything like that. And then 
CPS gets involved or whatever causes problems for our school districts, you know. Um, so uh, the, the employees from the employees that have talked to me, they they want the dress code addressed. They they need to have it addressed at the secondary levels. They don't want a liability in their hands, and I've heard too many employees saying that they're they're wanting to leave the district if this doesn't get fixed. So we asked our uh, high school principals to stay. You guys mind coming up to the podium, please? Mr. Galvan, Mr. Ramirez. Re regarding the dress code and low-cut shirts or midriff showing, um, that's still in our dress code, correct? Yes. Yeah, so those are not permitted? So just to kind of give a summary of what dress code has been this year for us. Um, so before school begins, we have registration. Unfortunately, this year we had online registration strictly because we couldn't bring people into the building like we traditionally do. Uh, but on their parents that do register the kids indicate that they've reviewed the student code of conduct with their children before they register. Uh, and that explains there is a dress code in place. Uh, so where do we make that available for folks? Uh, because we couldn't give them the leaflet the way we usually do. We're looking forward to this year having in-person registration where we get to talk to parents, we get to introduce them to the campus. These are the rules. This is what the dress code looks like. Uh, we make this available online. Uh, we posted our dress code on our webpage. Uh, we still follow it and, and are still constantly reminding students on what they should or should not wear to school. Um, this year in particular, though, we did not want to welcome our students. Uh, or we did want to welcome our students, I'm sorry, as best as possible to the building. Uh, so as students were returning after an almost 18 month hiatus uh, in the building uh, from being in person on campus. So we did reach out to Ms. Alvarado and Mr. Saldana at the beginning of the year for some advice and approval to at least not penalize students uh, with ISS for dress code infractions, especially if it was not something that was endangering them or disrupted the instruction. Uh, this also allowed teachers to focus entirely on building positive relationships with the students. Uh, they had not had them in front of them for a long time, and so we thought it was very important to not create those conflicts uh, for teachers immediately having to address dress code when on, at first sight instead of saying welcome to my classroom and following all the great stuff that they're teaching us right from flip flippins group um mid-semester though we felt hey it's time we're already getting we're moving on with the bringing kids back into the building here we are two months in uh, we held mid-semester meetings using zoom we couldn't bring everybody into the uh, gym like we traditionally do so we we used the power of zoom Myself and my administrators, we held a Zoom and, and went into every classroom in October. We reminded students of all the various topics, including dress code and what's accept what is acceptable and unacceptable. We did explain that we were trying to keep them in class as much as possible, and that we're not gonna penalize them with ISS, but we would keep reminding them to comply in the hallways. Uh, we even emphasized that administrators would keep addressing them in the hallways with dress code checks. And now at this point, uh, as we are starting the second semester, barely our six month back, you know, after 18 months gone, horrible habits were developed and now six months in, we're trying to break those away from them, uh, from our COVID remote learning. We're building our resources on campus to address these kinds of issues completely, including building a community closet with our communities and schools partners in the event that a student is asked to change something they're wearing that is outside of the code. This is an idea that Mr. Galvan gave me. He's, held, he's been at his campus for some years now, 11 years is what he told me. Uh, and so over the course of 11 years, he and CIS has developed a community closet full of t-shirts, spirit t-shirts and jeans and tights and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so if a kiddo is asked to change a shirt or whatever it may be, hey, put on some tights under a torn jean, he's got the stuff to equip him already and he doesn't have to send him home or take him out of the classroom into ISS all day and where they miss instruction. Uh, so we're working on that at the high school, of course, much bigger school, you know, almost three times the amount of kids that he has but the, the staff and, and everybody's committed to helping with this uh, and making sure that we're, we're equipping our kids so that they're not missing out on the instruction. Um, ideally, right, we wanna have as much clothing as possible, um, but we are also um, shot for space a little bit at the high school, so we have to kind of work on figuring out where we can house these kinds of things and keep the clothes clean and, and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, we're also in the process of converting the culture of clothing at our campus by offering our students the opportunities to wear professional wear more often for college, career, military readiness purposes. Uh, many times students don't have professional wear uh, because they can't, uh, they, they can't afford it. Uh, so we have started our Dress to Impress initiative. Uh, we started with a community closet of donated professional clothing in excellent condition. Uh, starting Monday, tw February 21st, we will make every Monday our Dress to Impress Monday. Um, 
where students can come to campus dressed as professionals with professional wear, technical career wear, or military wear, especially for our kids in programs like HRTC, the CNA programs, the carpentry programs, plumbing programs, whatever it may be, they can dress in that, in that attire so that it feels like a professional community and we're trying to emulate what the world outside looks like. Um, in the same regard, we already have a college wear day every Wednesday, which sees a large number of our students and staff wearing college shirts promoting that college going culture. Uh, so essentially we want to work our way through the dress code and campus dress culture to make it constructive and in the event that kids or parents aren't in accord we can at least carry through with the wraparound services that we need to provide uh, we definitely want every student in compliance uh, but with students that are 16 to 18 years of age buy in to the code and understanding why they need to dress a certain way drives up the compliance and helps us uh, grow our kids uh, providing them those professional opportunities so that is the condition of the dress code right now still in effect we're just not sending kids to iss and taking them plucking them out of the classroom they're hardly you know they just got back we don't want to tear them away from their teachers and you know put them in a space where they're not receiving that instruction so it is still vitally important for us and still a huge priority i have not had the staff concerns brought to me um, my door is always open my staff is very open with me and gives me concerns for a, of a lot of things um, so I haven't had those particular concerns. Parent concerns, I had one concern early in August uh, that I documented that I spoke to. Uh, Mr. Galvan has a little bit of a different um, experience right now. He's had some more staff concerns, uh, but we totally understand. We're not saying it's not something uh, that, that isn't visually there, uh, but we wanna go about it the way that we can actually address it and, and do it all the way around and not make it detrimental to kids. I have some dress codes that I wanna donate. To, Excellent. to you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. M Mr. Ramirez, I know there are, there are a lot of areas, um, instructional implementation, technology, where our staff is by the end, we're not going to be dinosaurs. We're going to move forward and be very progressive in a lot of areas. Uh -huh. uh, when you're dealing with an area that can be a little more conservative, like dress code, and, I, and we were aware of this, you kept us in, in the loop with this, and we supported it. Um, my assumption, but I'll, I'll ask you here in public, um, did you include your, your teachers? Did you have teams of teachers that had input on, on the development of the dress code as you rolled this out and why it was important not to, not to yank kids out into ISS? Yes, so starting, I mean, that was the first meeting we had of the year was, you know, what, why are we taking dress code out of your hands? Uh, they already had to welcome kids back after such a long period of time. They had huge instructional gaps. They were certainly very, very worried. Ms. 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 Maney's here in, in to tell you, right? They're very worried about all those things. Uh, with their students so with that in mind they're also thinking um you know all these problems are going to come about as far as dress code whatever let us as administrators deal with that we'll have those hard conversations those courageous conversations as i call them with my team with parents with students it's going to get dicey because they're going to be conflict you know in, in conflict these students i mean they they kind of realized that you know not coming to school is an option all of a sudden and we didn't want that to be an option so we were a little more happy to see them in camp on campus uh, wearing what they were wearing uh, and still advising them and still reminding them and still being a bug in their ear about what they need to do. Um, but we wanted, we did not want to lose our kids immediately coming back from this long hiatus. 18 months is a long time to develop some really bad habits. Uh, so we're slowly breaking them away from that. And more than that, I think if we take a constructive approach like we are, they'll see the, they'll see the light, they'll understand exactly why we want them to dress the way they dress. And if we provide them the wear, I think even more so they'll, they'll jump on board and really, really see it. And if not, we'll have to ultimately go down the road that the archaic road that we went down for so long uh, with dealing with uh, dress code through ISS and taking kids out and all that kind of stuff. It just never worked. In my experience as an administrator there previously, I saw administrators with a, a stack of dress code violations and that's all they did all day. Instead of being out in the hallways, talking to kids, seeing what their concerns are, right now I'll tell you the truth, our administrators are nurses, counselors, everything else under the sun because kids came back with a lot of social emotional needs. And I've had days that I've spent completely in the isolation room conducting tests, you know, COVID tests. So if I take my eye off that stuff, and you all saw it, the data for kids with controlled substances. That is my number one priority is clearing the school of drugs. Um, and essentially we have new drugs that have become a plague upon us, these vapes and whatnot. Um, those are the, the priorities of my, of my small handed, you know, because we have a, a small group of security guards. We used to have a security guard in every single wing. We, those, those days are gone, right? Our, our staff is not as replete as it was once. Um, so our security guards and, and officers that are on campus, they focus on the big problems, which are the drugs. And those things do not belong in our hallways. Um, so they've been very, very uh, adamant about it and active. 
um, and we didn't want something like dress code deterring them from that. Um, so, Mr. So, Mr. Ramirez, uh, if yes. I may, if I may, first and foremost, kudos on, on your initiatives that you have in place on your campus that dress to success and and having your closet there available. Uh, but what uh, you know, I still feel that you know you you are addressing dress code, and yes, we have other issues that take more priority, drugs and violence and things like that that we need to stay on top of. But what I'm hearing Ms. Lopez saying, and I'm not, I, again, I, what I heard is, is they, that she has, in fact, received some phone calls. Mm -hmm. And I just want to give you one example, because I'm an educator, you mm -hmm. know that. Yeah. As I was driving by the high school today, I, it was probably about 425, and you, can, you guys can go back and look at cameras, because I'm sure we have cameras everywhere. Mm -hmm. I saw a young lady that, that uh, the traffic was stopped for and, and crossed right in front of me. And I want to say both sides of her rib cage were showing, mm -hmm. based on what she was wearing. And so to me as an administrator, I would not think that that was appropriate. Then I, but I also don't think it's appropriate to be addressing a dress code issue at the end of the day. You know, I, I know that uh, working in a school, I have my teachers, my staff, everybody looking into dress code, and you're absolutely right. We're trying to welcome the kids in after that, that huge gap so where they were out, and we need, you know, we're appreciative that they're coming back, but there does need to be some type of uh, continuation as far as enforcing the dress code because mm -hmm. teachers do get uncomfortable. You know, and, and, I, and I hate to sound uh, uh, discriminating, but especially male teachers, having female teachers, it, it's not a comfortable feeling. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I, I applaud everything that you're doing, but I still ask as a board member that you, you and your staff continue to be very cognizant of the fact that, that kids are gonna push buttons and they're gonna push mm -hmm. and, and, and try to butt heads. But, but uh, again, uh, thank you for everything you're doing so far, but I'm sure that that you know, one individual you know, with all those kids that you've got in there, it, and it may not make a major difference, but, but to somebody, I'm sure that young lady crossing the street today made their life uncomfortable as, as a teacher. Uh, Mr. Ramirez and Mr. Galvan, I also applaud you for uh, what you're doing with the dress code. I do wanna make this suggestion because I did have a complaint and it was from an auxiliary staff. So I understand that your teachers are up to date, but just to make sure that the auxiliary staff is also aware of the initiatives that are in place to get the students mm -hmm. in the classrooms. Sure. Of course. Right, so thank you very much. Um, I, it sounds like you have some great initiatives, like Mr. Moreno said also, um, but we are an educational facility and we're preparing our kids to go out to the workforce and to be professionals, like you said. And, uh, and so that's part of what the schools do. That's, that's part of us teaching them that in life there are gonna be rules, there are gonna be laws that you're gonna have to follow even in your workplace as well. Mm -hmm. you know? And so that's where we start here in the schools. So thank you all for everything that y'all are doing. Hey, Mr. Ramirez, I have, a, I have a quick comment for, uh, for you guys, for all the administrators. I want to applaud each and every one of you all. You're going through some difficult times right now, and it's, it's very obvious. You know, so, you know, uh, once again, I mean, you know, uh, COVID did throw a wrench and all this stuff, and we all know it. We all face the challenges every single day in all our working environments ourselves, too. So, but I just want to applaud you guys and, and, and really, uh, you know, uh, thank you all for all the stuff, all, all the initiatives that you guys are doing behind the scenes that people don't know or not aware of, mm -hmm. okay, to try to keep our, our kids here, trying to keep them positive. You know, and, and, and uh, you know, the, at the end of the day, it's not perfect, but you know what, it was never perfect before, but I can guarantee you one thing, I said, you know, uh, San Luis ISD and the staff that we have are doing everything they can to make sure that they mitigate any other issues, but continue to give that positive reinforcement for our kids and our parents so they can, you know, bring their kids back and send their kids back. So I, I applaud you guys so much, I know it's not easy. I know there's a lot of, you know, things going on. Yeah, we we signed up because it was easy. No, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, you guys are the heroes out there, man. You know, each and every one of you guys are the heroes out there. So I congratulate you guys and I applaud you guys so very much yeah. for what you guys are doing. Yeah, and, right now. and, and, and we you. account for y'all support also. Every, everything we do is only possible because of you guys. So know that, you know, we also strive to represent you guys well. It's just like we strive to represent our kids and our, our parents and our, our community. So uh, we're very proud. We're both San Benito guys. We're very proud of our community. We, we want to see it uh, grow into something beautiful. So know that that's the, that's the root of our intentions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Any other committee concerns? Okay. Meeting adjourned at 639.